Welcome, folks. Um, I'm your host, uh, Sam, for the day. With me, I have the absolutely wonderful Catherine. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well, thanks. How about you? I am hanging in there. Um, before, and Catherine is our speaker uh, tonight, but before we give it to Catherine, uh, let's uh, do a quick uh, bit of housekeeping. Let's see if I can get my screen up. Uh, share screen. There. There. And there. So, Catherine, this might actually be a fun thing for um, you to kind of know the history of what uh, this user group started out as. So, welcome, everybody. And uh, we started way back in the days, I think 2008, 2009 timeframe, there used to be something called Windows Phone. Uh, and uh, <laughs> ours was, this was a group out of Ohio. Oh, I had one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I had like several. Uh, so this was <laughs> Central Ohio Windows Phone user group. So we used to call it like Cowbug, uh, adorably. Uh, so that, you know, uh, went on for a bit. And then we're like, oh, okay, let's just open up, not just mobile. We want to talk about all things Windows. So we became the Windows uh, developer user group. And then we started having speakers who were talking about other things like web was, you know, uh, you know all modern. So we had started talking AR, VR. We started talking modern web. So we said, let's just call it app dev. It cannot get any more generic. Like we are welcoming any type of app dev. <laughs> and then the pandemic hit and uh, we were virtual and we still are. And, uh, you know, um, now we are just global. So we're not even tied to any one city, although we have our roots uh, tied to Columbus, Ohio. Global app dev is as generic as we could get. Uh, like, unless we go to another planet, I, I think we are safe with this URL. Yeah. <laughs> this <name. laughs> it doesn't get any more than global. Yeah, we are welcoming everyone. So, uh, anyways, folks, if you're just joining us, um, we are uh, the app dev user group and uh, we meet uh, right here. Um, you know, every month and we are on Twitch, we do a little Teams Hangout after this and, you know, go tell your friends, you know, bring your, um, you know, anyone you want to this. Uh, we have a website, we have a meetup group where you can find out more. However, though, we uh, are still, we have our roots still in uh, Ohio and in, in the central or in the heartland region of, of America. So we still, you know, talk about our sister conferences and things happening around us. Uh, these are our wonderful sponsors, by the way, who keep us going. Uh, Progress is, you know, lets us host. Uh, we partner with Microsoft. We partner with Visual Studio Live. And we'll talk about some of the conferences that are coming up where, you know, you can go. Uh, speaking of uh, things nearby, this is our sister user group. This is the .NET user group uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And they meet fourth Thursdays of each month, which some months happens to be the same, which looks like this one. Uh, oh, they're meeting in on Wednesday. That's different because they always do Thursdays. Anyways, but this should be fun. This is my good friend, Matt Elan. Looks like he's speaking and it's about automating my dog with Azure Cognitive Services so that dog doesn't go out and bark at squirrels. Uh, so. I'm guessing some sort of an AI trying to identify things maybe on the street. That should be fun. Um, so they also live stream, and I think they're starting to meet a little bit in person, but they definitely live stream uh, everything that's going on. Uh, so go check that out uh, this Wednesday. Now we have some uh, you know big things coming up. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully we are looking at the you know the brighter side at the end of the tunnel. Coming out of pandemic <laughs> mode, a lot of more things are happening in person, which is beautiful. As much as we do online stuff, uh, sometimes the networking, just the in-person, sitting down with somebody is, is really nice. So we are uh, doing a big conference in Boston coming up uh, by, you know, the you know mid of um, September. Uh, this is DevReach. We host a huge conference uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, but this is the first time we are bringing it to the U.S. So, uh, Catherine, you're going to be there, right? I am. Yeah, and, uh, and actually, I believe we are live streaming this as well, right? You can buy a yes, digital yeah. ticket. So mm -hmm. if you are still feeling your way back Absolutely. amidst the pandemic questions, you yeah. can catch all of this online. Yeah. But so. it'll be fun in person. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, come as you are. And this is kind of all, yeah. all we say, just how, whatever is your comfort level. And, you know, yes. so come as well. <laughs> All right, uh, so we do partner up um, with uh, Visual Studio, like I said, and then the company that puts it together, and uh, they do shows all around the country, uh, mostly in the United States, and their next one that's coming up, uh, we just did Microsoft uh, headquarters back in Redmond, their next one that's coming up towards the end of September is in San Diego, so come and join us in you know sunny San Diego, 
if you want to make you know make that a week long conference uh, type thing uh, and get to hang out with lots of speakers and you know take it all in with a you know workshop day before and after and you get a big discount if you go you know use the user group um, code so let us know and uh, yeah that's what's coming up and drum rolls we have oh, Catherine no. <laughs> here and I am uh, really looking forward to this because I am as bad as it gets um, understanding UI and UX as a developer, and uh, <laughs> you are as good as it gets. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Nice. Thank okay. you so much. So yeah, if like you're ready, the... Catherine. Oh, sorry. I was going to bring up your um, desktop if that you're ready. That's great. All yeah. Right. Yeah. Go there you go. It. Perfect. No, I was laughing at the comment in the chat <laughs> where uh, Sean was combining the one about the dog and this, trying to teach the dog about fonts. Yep, buckle up. That's our goal tonight. <laughs> so, hello, everyone. As I was so wonderfully introduced, my name is Catherine Grayson Nance. I'm the developer advocate for Kendra React at Progress. But uh, in fact, that was not always what I had planned to be doing. <laughs> In fact, uh, I actually have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Studio Arts. I went to school to become a graphic designer, and I did. Um, I worked in ad agencies for years afterwards. I did all sorts of design work. But slowly, that kind of graphic design turned into email and web design, and that turned into email and web development, which turned into UI design and front-end development, and I found myself here. <laughs> I could probably talk, it could spend a whole another 60 minutes talking about just the experience of kind of moving between all of those roles and why and how, but I really only bring it up here uh, just to kind of give a little bit of context on why I'm talking about design. These days, I really like to live in that world between design and development. Uh, I've kind of been very intentional about seeking out jobs and opportunities that will continue to allow me to kind of keep a foot in each world. I cannot imagine never designing again any more than I can imagine never developing again. They both just feel like two sides of the same coin to me. Uh, however, as someone who's kind of had that experience in my career and made that transition, I've also gotten to see firsthand the way that a lot of my fellow developers can really struggle with design. And that could be in the form of like, difficulty collaborating with the design team, or frustration trying to build something of their own uh, side project or uh, something that they're working on, their own app, maybe they're at a startup or their founder, or even just some of that small stuff that ends up kind of landing in the developer's lap when you have to set the right amount of padding or you're trying to fit a feature into an existing layout. Things that you might think of as design problems, but often kind of become developer problems. And we get Sorry, oh, yeah. Catherine. No, uh, please. Oh, well, I, I, I did mention to Catherine, like, I'm the annoying sidekick who just keeps on asking, you know, dumb <laughs> questions all the way through. I'll, so I'll hang out here. But just wanted to say hi to some of our, you know, uh, regulars here, Code with Sean uh, and the Palm. Good to see you here. And <laughs> I think, Catherine, like, your, your background gives you such a perspective, such a different perspective. You've seen both sides. And like, I'm already looking at, you know, your beautifully designed, you know, slides and just like, <laughs> like, this is not our you know ball game but you know, here you are teach us <laughs> no it's it's interesting because when you don't know a lot about design then even those little tiny choices can feel really overwhelming i think that's most of kind of what i hear as that that feedback when i'm talking to developers they'll come up and kind of do that thing where they're like this just doesn't look right or i can't make it look professional and they cannot figure out why they can identify that there is something wrong or that they want it to look different, but they cannot even figure out how to describe it. It's like trying to solve a riddle in a whole another language. So that's really what I'm hoping to be able to offer you today. It's kind of a Rosetta Stone for understanding the world of design by learning a little bit about the fundamentals, uh, some of the terminology, just enough knowledge for you to identify what is going on in your designs and why. <laughs> but before we dig too far into that, there is a myth about design that I like to start every time by debunking. And that is the idea that you have to have an eye for design. 
I think there's this assumption that for design or any kind of artistic talent, it just has to be something that you're born with and you either have it or you don't. It's this kind of like magical thing. And if you don't have it, then you're just out of luck. Um, but this is frankly not true and <laughs> complete BS. Design is a science. And it's based on what we know about how our eyes and our brains process the world. And once you have a grasp of those fundamentals, then you can also create designs that very naturally align with how humans interpret information. Even if you're not looking to learn everything about design or make your career in design, you can still totally build up a skill set that enables you to understand what makes a design good and then replicate that in your work. Yeah. <laughs> A terrible pun. <laughs> so here's the thing, though, like when we don't know the science, like do you think we, uh, you know, still can figure out that something is not right, and then maybe the eye is to get some help, unless you know the science? Yeah, I mean, I think I've described it kind of similar to like some people have an ear for music, right, and they can hear a song once, and they sit down in front of the piano, and they can kind of plunk it out, and they might have kind of a natural aptitude. But even those people are not going to be able to sit down and compose a symphony without some advanced music education. Right. So you might have the eye in that you, it's a little bit easier to identify kind of what works or what doesn't, but I don't think that alone is ever enough. So the idea of having to have that as a prerequisite is something that I like to kind of <laughs> reassure people is not a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But let's go ahead and dig in. Welcome to Foundations of Design. <laughs> Today we will be talking through some basics on color, layout, and typography. I will be your professor, and I promise it will be much less painful than all of the art history lectures that I had to sit through in college. Uh, plus, you already don't have to sit on those like super uncomfortable, terrible metal stools that they put in every art classroom for no reason. So you're already winning. You've already got this better than I had it. <laughs> why, why is that? Why did they do that? Like That's like I the first image you always know. get. <laughs> and I will, it's true. Like Again, yeah. I, I sat through all these classes in college, and why can they not put real desks and chairs in there? Miserable. Who makes that decision? <laughs> Let's go ahead and start with a little bit on color. So there is a lot to cover here. Feel free in the chat to jump in if you have questions or anything, and I will certainly try to answer them. Uh, we're going to talk through how colors work, kind of how we talk about them, how our eyes make sense of them. And I like to start off with something a little bit familiar for developers, which is RGB color. So when we are working with colors on the computer, we are working with what's called an additive color system. And that means that when all of the colors are combined, the result is going to be pure white. And this happens with any time we are dealing with colors from light, uh, that have light behind them, things like computer screens, projectors, you know, the movie theater. That's why when we're coding RGB values, when we write white, it's that RGB 255, 255, 255, all those values cranked all the way up to the max combined together to create white. But on the other hand, <clears throat> excuse me, colors from pigment work on a subtractive system and they create black when all of the colors are combined. You can think about like paint or food coloring as an example for that. The more you add, the darker it gets. And eventually, if you add everything all the way, it will turn black. And as you can kind of see here in this picture, the RGB and CMYK models have the same colors in them. They're just kind of flipped, you know, inside to outside. The order is kind of inverse in the way that they combine. And that's the difference between adding or subtracting to create color. And practically, this means that when you're working in RGB, your colors are going to naturally look a little bit brighter, a little bit more vibrant, because again, they've got that light behind them. Whereas when you're working with ink or pigment, you're going to get like truer, deeper, but since we are focused on UI design here, we're going to kind of set the CMYK stuff aside and focus instead on the RGB. So each one of these boxes of three colors is a pixel. And when we are defining our colors using the RGB method, this is what we are defining, these three kind of sections. 
And from a distance, our eyes blur all of those subpixels and pixels together to create anything that we see on a screen. <laughs> and this, in fact, is actually a really old technique because long before there were screens or pixels, there was paint and pointillism. <laughs> This painting is Seurat's Ascende on Le Grand Jatte, and from a distance, it looks pretty much like any other painting, but if you get your face like right up next to it, or uh, as close as you can get before you get kicked out of the museum, <laughs> then you will see that it kind of works the same way those pixels do. Uh, or rather, the pixels will work just like this. This approach was part of a broader movement in art history that was called post-impressionism, which of course came immediately after Impressionism, because as it turns out, naming is really hard everywhere and not just in programming. <laughs> but post-Impressionist artists were really curious about light and about color and how the human eye interpreted them. So all of their paintings were kind of experiments around that. And you can kind of see those same like short, quick brushstrokes or dots across all the other paintings of the same period. These are two more examples, Monet's Water Lilies and Van Gogh's Starry Night. And this approach is completely dependent on how our eyes interpret the colors based on the other colors that are around it. And I can imagine you're kind of thinking like, cool, neat trivia. Maybe this will help me out next time I'm at the bar with my friends. But what does this have to do with user interfaces? And in fact, this knowledge about how our eyes and our brains interpret color can really help us understand the influence of context in colors. Because as we can see, demonstrated by the paintings and the pixels, our understanding of color is based entirely on the colors that are next to it. So this is in fact a little optical illusion because at first glance, those two smaller squares seem to be different colors. Uh, but in truth, they are exactly the same. <laughs> Depending entirely on which background it's paired with, our eyes are going to perceive that very, very differently. And having that kind of contextual awareness is really huge when it comes to making choices for interfaces. Because a color that looks one way in isolation is going to look totally different when it's on a screen with the rest of the colors uh, applied to the elements around it. And in fact, that's often where people kind of struggle most is putting together uh, color schemes that work. Because choosing one color doesn't feel very hard, but choosing four or five that all work nicely together, that is a horse of a different color, pun intended. <laughs> but this is, we can... fasc this is fascinating. Like, this... <laughs> I, I cannot believe like, the two squares are the same color. Right, wow. it's entirely influenced by, yeah, by what we put next to it, right? And yeah. I think that's, some of that gets into like accessibility and stuff too, mm -hmm. in terms of how can we read something? How clear is it? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about like contrast and value, because I could nerd out on this stuff for ages. <laughs> so, let me ask you this, like the fact that RGB kind of adds up to everything being bright and towards the white, uh, mm -hmm. do you think that like, that has an influence on you know how we choose colors because I mean I'm sure like we have seen those optical illusions where if you look at something uh, and then you turn to something really bright and white you can still have remnants of what you saw right yeah. so so that's that is actually that's a real thing uh, there's a word for that called vibrating colors yeah. uh, when you have two bright colors that are next to each other because our eyes do retain that after image when we look at something mm -hmm. bright and that's especially noticeable on a screen. Um, and what happens is we'll retain that after image and then that overlaps with the colors that we're currently looking at and it causes yeah. all sorts of havoc as we try to make sense of things. Uh, so yes, and that doesn't happen in the same way when we are looking at stuff that's printed on the page because it doesn't have the light behind it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I, so for what it's worth, like I got to hang, hang out with Catherine last week, we were at a conference together and I had no idea the person sitting next to me had so much of wealth of science and just knowledge that you're full of. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Just so much knowledge about weird little details. It's <laughs> no, no. always like, yes, I know a lot about this random thing. Yeah, Buckle up for a rant. Us. 
<laughs> keep dropping it and dropping this on us. We love it. <laughs> on that note, oop, I messed up my joke. I forgot to set up my joke. I got distracted. We're going to talk about the color wheel next. Not this one. <laughs> Your worst enemy, the spinning wheel of death. But in fact, this one. The jokes are better when you mess them up first and then have to go back and explain them. Let's say, uh, if you want to start public speaking, that's my tip. <laughs> but uh, this is the Johannes Eaton color wheel. It does a really good job of demonstrating the relationship between your primary colors, which are these here in the beginning, in the center, uh, with all of the rest. So anytime you combine any two of your primary colors, the result is a secondary color. So you can see those kind of here in this middle ring. And then if you combine a primary color with a secondary color, you get a tertiary color. And you can do that, you know, in that way, every single color can be derived from these three primaries. Now, when we are talking about a color's actual color, we're talking about its hue, right? And that's the thing that makes us describe yellow is yellow as opposed to red or green. You know, it's kind of the, the name that we've given it. But hue is really just one half of a color. There is also oop, value. There we go. So you can create value in three different ways. It is the lightness or darkness of a given hue. It's the thing that makes the difference between like sky blue or navy, you know? Uh, and you can do that by adding white to create a tint, adding gray to create a tone, or adding black to create a shade. Colors can also be really broadly categorized into two sections, your warm colors and your cool colors. Uh, and you can probably kind of guess how this works from the name even, right? Your warm colors are reds, oranges, yellows, browns, things that feel kind of warmth. They evoke feelings of like sunlight, daytime. Whereas your cool colors are your blues, greens, and purples, things we associate with the feelings of coolness or night. And beyond the realm of that pure physical sensation, we also kind of extend these into their related emotions. So warm colors will feel happy or energizing or passionate, and your cool colors will feel more relaxing or steady. They kind of uh, contribute like to trustworthiness or knowledge when we think about like a brand. Quick question here, Catherine. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no. Uh, I will. I will always just like ramble through because I'm. I've given this one a bit, and so I kind of get into like a, let's go, but please interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> so for folks who have um, difficulty identifying colors, uh, and that, mm -hmm. that's a big spectrum, right? So is yes. that to do with primaries or any of the hues or the shades or the tones that you talked about? So you're asking kind of what color blindness affects? Just to yeah, like. Yeah. yeah, and essentially, like, what effect that has on the warmth or the coolness or any of the, you know, plus white or plus black or plus gray. Yeah, so uh, color blindness is really interesting because it will change the way that the hue is understood, but not the value. Mm. So, uh, and it depends entirely how the hue is interpreted, depends on the type of color blindness, right? Because there's, you know, red-green color blindness, blue-yellow color blindness, and all of those impact the way white colors can be seen and which can't, and the kind of ways in which that's interpreted. But value is just the lightness or darkness. And so if you were to even take all colors away, assuming it was a complete kind of grayscale color blindness, you can still totally perceive the value uh, and see which things are lighter or darker than others, which is why contrast is such a big deal mm -hmm. in accessibility. Because uh, really what you're doing when you're creating contrast is trying to increase the value difference between two colors that are next to each other. And that's that contrast percentage or ratio mm -hmm. that you see when you sometimes like plug things into accessibility checkers. That's what it's measuring. I see. Yeah. So yeah, there are some ways that you can still work with colors uh, to let them be as accessible as possible. But that's also kind of why color is only like one third of <laughs> what we talk about here. Because sometimes if you are working with someone who is entirely visually impaired, then it doesn't matter what the colors are. <laughs> you have to play the design in other ways. <laughs> so. Whether <laughs> that 
And it's probably not the smoothest transition into color schemes, but we're going to talk about them anyway. It was actually really interesting when I was giving this talk at um, Code Palooza, the and actually at a couple other places, um, the projectors aren't always calibrated like just right. And so you end up in a situation where you're almost unintentionally <laughs> mimicking colorblindness. Because yeah. it's one of those things like in where you, you always kind of have a laugh at it. But it is a good reminder that everyone is going to see color differently and not everyone is going to see color in the uh, exact environment that you hoped they would, you know, sitting at a desk with a bright light next to them or something, right? So mm -hmm. worth keeping in mind as we design. <laughs> uh, anyway, when you're putting together a color scheme, I really suggest starting with kind of one main color. You probably already have a brand color that you're working with. Many people do. If you're totally getting to start from scratch, um, Choosing between like a warmer, a cool color, and then narrowing it down from there is often a good way to start. Uh, then I really recommend using one of these four major types of color schemes, monochromatic, analogous, complementary, or triadic, to kind of expand that single color into a full palette that you can work with. Uh, you don't have to use, like these are not the only way to create a color palette, but for people who are starting out, I think these are really good ways to create color groups that you already know are going to work, right? And there are all sorts of like color palette generators that you can use that will let you input one color and create these from it. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly about uh, some of these. Another quick question, Catherine. Does yeah. com complementary mean that you have, like, let's say you choose just those, you know, five colors that you have and you, you have lots of UI and you, you know, does it mean that your contrast is at a better starting point? Not necessarily. Because um, again, in addition to like each of these colors, you'll kind of have, you get to kind of take the lightness and darkness of all of them as well. So you always get kind of options even within like the boundaries of a, a color scheme, right? So monochrome is actually a really good example of that where you've only got one color technically, but this color palette includes both tints and tones of the one. So you kind of get the option to create uh, value and contrast in that way. Uh, one of the most popular examples of this is Facebook, of course, <laughs> with their like super blue interface. <laughs> uh, analogous kind of cuts a little arc across the color wheel. So these are all colors that sit right next to each other here. And again, you can kind of take lightness or darkness up and down kind of that arc as much as you needed. Um, this is a really, really good one for design newbies because it's pretty hard to mess up, but also you get lots of different colors to play with as opposed to just the one in monochrome. I don't know why my screen is doing that. I don't know if you guys can see that. <laughs> yeah, it's turning pink. It's, it's giving us a color test. It is a little bit, mm. but... <laughs> Complementary ones uh, will reach right across the color wheel. Uh, a lot of people are already familiar with these. They're kind of ones that you think of when you think about color pairings. Your Christmas colors, red and green. The movie posters really like blue and orange. <laughs> There's something about kind of those polar opposites that's very compelling. Uh, and Amazon does actually a really good job with this in a way that's interesting because their, their brand, that arrow is bright orange. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever had to deal with orange in an interface. It's very hard to work with. It's really bright. It's hard to make it accessible. It can be a real challenge. And so they kind of solved that design problem by reaching across the color wheel and picking a color that's a little bit easier to work with. So they've got that blue as most of their kind of actual interface, right? That's their text colors in most places. That's the like background UI colors, and then they can use the orange just kind of as like little pops of color uh, in a way to incorporate it so it feels on brand, but without everything having to be difficult orange. <laughs> yeah. so. so Catherine Code with Sean was saying uh, movie themes tend to have the, you know, the art and the sky, uh, and, and maybe that okay. can be looked at com complementary. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always like a dark background with, you know, a, a light text on it. 
And see, I, I feel so, you know, uncool. Uh, did you know about this? The Cooders.co that Napalm was talking about? Color, color generator. This is amazing. They're really fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. And the last one that we had on the list was triadic. This one, as you can probably kind of guess from the tri in the name, includes kind of three main colors. In this case, this example uses the primary colors, the like red, yellow, and blue. Uh, they kind of equally are spaced out from each other, creating this triangle that goes across the whole color wheel. So there's like a fine art example that I put over here. Uh, Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring. You can see the red, the yellow, the blue. And then uh, in a slightly less fine art example, the screenshot from the Pepsi website <laughs> with their red, blue, yellow. And you can kind of tell. This one I think is interesting, the Pepsi example because yellow is not one of their official brand colors. But you can tell that whoever put this together knew their color theory, because all of the kind of images that they've chosen really naturally incorporate that yellow, and that rounds out the design, even though that's not technically a color that was probably in their palette. It's kind of a smart move. <laughs> the last one I want to talk about briefly is the high contrast color scheme. Um, so obviously first you wanna make sure that you are running whatever colors you have chosen through an accessibility checker. The one that I have in the example here is the Adobe Color Contrast Checker. But another thing that you might think about is creating a specific high contrast theme. This one is from the Windows operating system. High contrast themes usually have a pure black background and then some neon uh, for their text or other highlight colors. You might think kind of at first, like this is visually unpleasant or jarring, or maybe even bad design. Um, but you have to remember that design is always about the ability to convey the information. And the goal here, this is an exercise in pure readability, right? So this probably would not be what you would choose for your primary <laughs> color scheme, but offering it to your users as an option so that they have something that is extra readable is something that can be really, really valuable to them. Yeah, and you know, I live a little bit in the world of you know native mobile stuff, and uh, this is this is difficult. This is very difficult when you have the mm -hmm. you know the light and the dark uh, modes. So yeah. you know, for all of your UI, you have to kind of choose you know, and, and, and like you said, like some of the you know modern designs kind of lean so much towards like the matte finishes, but that doesn't you know scale to you know contrast at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the easiest option is to have another color system, yeah. right? <laughs> but it's really going to depend on the project and the resources available as to whether or not that's the right fit. <laughs> but that brings us through color. We're hitting layout. I'm going to try and like zip through them because I'm a little worried we're going to run over. <laughs> but it's more fun to talk. Sorry so to ask wanna... so many questions. Yeah. No, I think the questions are good. That's why I'm like, I need to speed up my end, not anything else. To talk about layouts, <laughs> we need to talk first a little bit about the human brain. <laughs> and I find the, just, the human brain is so cool, right? And there is so much that we don't know about it, which in and of itself is also extremely cool. Uh, but one of the things that we do know is how much our brains love to categorize and organize and try to try to put things in little boxes that we can understand, right? It's how we attempt to make sense of the complete deluge of sensory input that we are getting every single day all the time. It is such a natural human desire to try and simplify and condense the wide variety of the world around us into kind of smaller boxes of things that we can understand. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that all sounds like very philosophical and abstract, but in fact, it is directly relevant to design because we do the same thing when we look at a design. We immediately try to kind of break it down, sorting the elements on the page into an order that will allow us to digest the content, make sense of it as quickly as possible. Um, and when we have created a layout that doesn't look good or doesn't feel intuitive, it's often because we are unintentionally working against the natural organizational methods that our brains use to try and process this stuff. Once we have 
and understanding of how our brains sort things, then we can try to kind of align our designs with those methods in order to make them a little bit more intuitive. There is, in fact, scientific principles that we have identified um, about how we group things. That's called Gestalt theory. Uh, there are six main patterns that we use to try and sort information, uh, similarity, closure, continuity, proximity, figure ground, and symmetry. Some will also include a seventh pattern called common fate. Uh, but these, like so many design things, make more sense with visual examples. <laughs> so I'm going to talk through them real quick. Uh, similarity means that we will naturally assume a relationship between similar elements. So here we've kind of categorized these, our brains categorize these, into horizontal rows. Even though everything is kind of the same size, it's equally spaced, the shape and the color being the same horizontally means that we want to sort these into rows. We assume there must be a connection there. Closure means that we will try to fill in any kind of missing gaps or spaces to make sense of information. So here we see a square and a diamond, even though neither are actually present. They're just these kind of weird Pac-Man wedges. But our brains want to fill in the gaps between them to turn this into something that we understand. Continuity means that a viewer's eye will continue along the same kind of unbroken path through a design unless it is actively interrupted. It's kind of similar to closure, and it has to do with how the eye moves and how it follows that line. But this talks about what interrupts it, basically what's, what's big enough or important enough to pull our eyes off of that invisible path. Proximity means that we will naturally group things that are placed very closely together. So in this example, we want to group these two over here into one column because they're closer to each other than they are to this one over here. Figure ground is actually really cool because it has to do with our attempt to impose like a 3D understanding of the world onto these 2D objects and designs. Uh, we're so used to functioning in three dimensions with a sense of depth that we carry that over even when we're looking at things that we know don't have any depth, designs on paper or, you know, flat laptop screens. But because we are so used to kind of breaking the world down in this way, we will identify things that feel closer to us as the subject uh, and everything else kind of gets relegated to the background. Yeah, Catherine's <laughs> chat, chat room is complaining that you're messing with our eyes. <laughs> and this is this is so on point. You know the the thing uh, that our you know the, the brain just fills in the gap, right? Yeah. And, and this this was uh, this was the hot topic of debate. Uh, if you folks notice our progress software um, logo, this was heavily debated because like some people see upward pointing arrows while some people see two boxes and. It's maybe it's just how our you know brains are wired as to which one we see. Uh, it's, you know, I think the simplistic <laughs> folks like me just see arrows, but there is just so much that you can your brain can just uh, fill in the gap if there is. And I'm like looking around my office for something with the logo now because I haven't thought. Of it. <laughs> I'm like, where's the progress logo? I need to look now. <laughs> I would have told you it was boxes, <laughs> but. Oh, man. Sy sy symmetry is uh, th this. This I think is very relatable to you know lay people like you know like me, because like I have I don't know anything about the science, but lack of this can, it just immediately hits my eye. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because symmetry is one of those like very it is very natural to us because it has to do with our sense of balance, right? Like we right. really want things to feel equal, and a lot of that we can trace back to like basically instincts, right? Because things that aren't balanced, structures that aren't balanced are dangerous. When we are unbalanced, it's usually dangerous. So we have this very like instinctual hate for things that feel the off, right? We we want to straighten the picture on the wall that's that's off kilter. We want to like fix things that look like they could fall down, you know? Um, so we, as viewers, will kind of seek out and feel reassured by this kind of symmetry and, and visual balance in design. <laughs> the last one of these is common fate, which it doesn't make it in every list because it has specifically to do with movement. So if you're just working in like a static design, 
this won't apply as much, but if you're doing UI animations, I think it's really interesting. It's kind of a combination of proximity and continuity that says when elements are placed really closely together and have coordinated movements, we will see them as, as connected as one item, kind of like a school of fish. So it's a good one to keep in mind if you are animating things on your website. <laughs> now, once we've got a good feeling for how and why our brains organize things, we can start to combine that knowledge with visual hierarchy in order to kind of direct our viewer's eye through uh, the design that we're creating. So visual hierarchy has to do with creating contrast in your design by combining the use of size, placement, and color to kind of manipulate the visual weight of all your elements and help your most important elements stand out. This gives you control over the balance of the page. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about balance in just a minute, um, but kind of gives you control over the balance and the order in which people will notice each element. Like that idea of when you look at something, what do you see first? What draws your eye? Like what feels most important? Those things are not left to chance. We can control all of them through design. And playing with size is probably the fastest and easiest way to do this. We do it all the time as developers with the like heading system, right? Like that's probably the easiest one, the HTML, H1, H2, H3 through six, you know, paragraphs. All of that built in creates a very natural hierarchy, right? Uh, so usually the biggest stuff goes kind of at the top that will draw our attention and then it works down kind of in order of relevance so that things that feel less important are usually in smaller print, right? We can see a really good example of this with word clouds, which I got to tell you, uh, don't create word clouds. <laughs> They're kind of a, a lazy, boring design, but they do do a really good job of kind of illustrating that way that size creates hierarchy. Because the first thing that we see here is going to be the word education. Uh, even though it's not necessarily at the top of the design, it's not kind of at the, that is where our eyes will go first because it is so much bigger than everything else. So a good rule of thumb is to make sure that your most important element is gonna be the largest one on your page. And then you can set the size of the other elements kind of relative to that based on their importance, the order of their relevance. Kind of hand in hand with that is the idea of placement, right? So like the newspaper, you start with the stuff at the top that is the most important and then kind of work your way down. And the newspaper combines size with that as well, right? So at the top, the stuff that's biggest, as you move down the page, it gets progressively smaller and also progressively less important. Um, you always wanna put the stuff that needs to be seen kind of all the way at the top and then work your way down so that as we scroll, as our eyes skim a page, that's what we see first. Finally, the last piece of that is color. <laughs> color is a little bit different. Sorry, I saw the chat. I was laughing at it. <laughs> I, I think I have some actual examples from the progress website in here later, so it's not actually subliminal. <laughs> just went full in. Um, but yeah, the last piece of visual hierarchy is color. Uh, and that's a little bit different because, as we talked about, not everyone can perceive colors in the same way, and colors change based on what's around them. So you can see here with the light and the dark background, different colors are the ones that you will notice first. So on the dark background, your eyes are more drawn to the light colors because again, that change in value on the light one, the ones that will jump out at you are the darker ones. So you have to kind of keep all of that in mind as you're trying to figure out what colors things should be as they draw somebody's eye. Uh, easy way to do that is either to kind of have one pop of color on something that is otherwise kind of monochrome, uh, or to use your, uh, your color scheme to your advantage here. So in this example, they've used a complementary color scheme, right, that orange and blue, and by going kind of polar opposites and then light and dark, right, the lighter background, the darker text, they've kind of doubled down on making that text really draw your eye right here. As promised, we will talk a little bit about balance. 
And as we mentioned, right, like that's something super innate to us. All of these things make us feel kind of uncomfy, right? We want people to be standing evenly weighted on both feet. We want things to feel level. <laughs> we want them to feel stable. When they're not, we can feel kind of uneasy or tense. And that carries over when we are looking at designs and things that are unbalanced. Uh, that is not something that we want people to feel when they are looking at our applications. So it's always best to kind of work within balance, right? To create things that are balanced, things just need to be equally weighted on either side of a central, center vertical axis, right? So it's almost exactly like physical balance, like a seesaw. If you were to draw a line down the center of whatever you've designed, you can kind of feel whether the visual weight lines up. <laughs> So you can kind of tell here, right, like which side is visually heavier. The one with the bigger square is the one that feels like if these were on a seesaw, it would tilt. Even though they're the same shape and the same color, the larger size of that one square gives it a much heavier visual weight. And again, because of that, that's where I will go first. <laughs> Most of the time, though, we want to create designs that feel balanced, and symmetry is the easiest way to do that when we perfectly mirror two sides of the design. Um, this approach gets used a lot for things like luxury brands because that perfect symmetry creates a real feeling of like strength and permanence and stability, kind of timelessness. You can see in each one of these examples, if you were to draw a line right down the middle, it's almost exactly mirrored. It feels equal on each side. But balance does not have to be a mirror image every time. In fact, most of the time when we're dealing with balance in UI designs, we're talking about asymmetrical balance. Symmetrical balance is, you know, it's beautiful, but it's also not very practical. We don't always get our UI elements in like perfectly matched sets. So sometimes we have to find other ways to make sure that the weight is even across the entirety of the composition. That's where the progress one is. I knew I had an example in here somewhere from there. Uh, the text image balance is one that's super common uh, for landing pages where you have one really big image on one side and then big text on the other that balances that. It's also really common with uh, things like sidebars because you can also create asymmetrical balance through placement. And bigger items near the center of a composition can balance out smaller ones near the edges. Those are kind of the patterns that you are, you're gonna be more likely to use when creating like app interfaces and stuff. Cause they just make a little more sense. They give you a little bit more flexibility than making sure everything is like mirror, mirror. <laughs> the last piece of layout that I wanna talk about is white space. Cause thus far we have focused almost entirely on stuff that we add to the page. But just as important is the place where we don't put anything at all. <laughs> This is one of the mistakes that I think is probably most common, right? Because uh, often when we sit down as designers, we think like, all right, it's a blank page. It is my job to fill it. I'm going to put as much on here as humanly possible. It's a understandable instinct, but it will also often kind of do you wrong. <laughs> so it often means that we are filling the page with things that aren't actually furthering the purpose of our design. I mean, design's a little different from art in that way. The design always has to be communicating something. We're helping a user execute a goal. We're helping them complete a task. And the more things that we put on a page that aren't directly relevant to that goal make our design difficult to understand. So the like cruise.co example over here, everything feels really evenly weighted, it's unclear where our eyes are supposed to start. It's unclear what's actually important here. And there's not a single drop of white space for our eyes to like rest and figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs> Whereas the New York Times page still has a ton of information, like I don't know, five or six different stories, website boilerplate, big photos, like there's a lot still being communicated on that page but it's much, much easier for our brains to parse. <laughs> and Catherine Chatroom is commenting how like you show this in uh, in the very you know slide deck that you're using. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh.
All right. The last topic that I had for today is typography, which is a cool one, I think, because we learn to read like super, super young, right? When we're like what, four or five. And from then on, typography is pretty much inescapable. So all of us are able to identify bad type when we see it because the goal is pretty simple. We need to be able to read it. If we can't read it, then it's bad typography. So obviously the question as always, is how do we create type that actually looks good? Uh, type is also something that's interesting because I feel like you need just a little bit of a history lesson in order to fully understand some of the terms. So we're gonna wind it back a little bit and talk about the printing press. <laughs> so type the way that we think about it today, which is the printing of letters by machine, not like writing things by hand, uh, begins with the printing press. Before the invention of the movable type printing press, we used woodblock carvings primarily in order to print things. That was effective for like making lots of stamps effectively of the same thing. But it was really hard because you had to make a new carving every time you needed to like print a new page in a book. Whereas having movable type allowed us to kind of reorient things, lock them into place and quickly make lots of different, uh, lots of different layouts. This happened uh, around 1440 when Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. We've seen some earlier like movable type systems in China using clay and wood earlier than that, but it didn't really catch on because the Chinese language was so much more complex. There were so many more variations, but that same kind of movable, physical movable type was not as useful, frankly. But this printing press is important to be aware of because that was the origin of the art of typesetting. And we still very much use all of that today. Uh, not necessarily the manual printing press, but all of the terminology and the ideas behind setting type have remained almost the same <laughs> as we've moved from that into the computer age. So I'm going to talk through some basic terms that you should know. Uh, character is any single element, a letter, a punctuation mark, a number, basically anything that would have been on one of those single blocks of movable type. A typeface is a collection of characters in a specific style. Um, you probably work with these all the time, right? I can see some people are naming them in the chat even. Comic Sans, Roboto, Times New Roman. All of that kind of stuff that is stylistically the same is a typeface. A font, on the other hand, is a specific version of a typeface. Those words often get used interchangeably, but they're not actually the same thing. So now you can be the most annoying person in your office by correcting everyone. <laughs> a font is pretty much any time you're dealing with any specific, any, any specification of style. Right, so once you have specified a font size, if you're using styles like bold or italics, uh, condensed or wide, all of those that are kind of versions of that typeface are technically a font. <laughs> Kerning is the space between two characters. So anytime you want to kind of move things around to give them a little more or less breathing room, that is kerning. This most often happens when the top or bottom of one character is significantly wider than the other. So like the A and the V here in this example, or W, uh, and adjusting that space can make a word feel a little bit more cohesive. Um, I had distracted by a question in the chat, which I'm gonna answer because I think it's a really good one. The one that says, why isn't it called typeface in CSS? Um, and the answer is they renamed a whole bunch of stuff, <laughs> actually. Uh, the other thing that is interesting with CSS, right? Uh, this idea of tracking also exists in CSS. It's been renamed to be called letter spacing. Tracking refers to the spacing uh, between all of your characters, like across a word or sentence or text block. We see the same thing happen actually with letting, which is the space between lines of text. Originally that came from lead strips that we use to kind of separate lines in a paragraph. In CSS, that got renamed to be line height. Um, why exactly? I wasn't there. Unfortunately, no one asked me. <laughs> That's why. Um, but uh, I would group that in general with a list of these kind of typographic words that got rebranded when they made the jump over to CSS. Um, so 
So yeah, <laughs> hardest problem in computer science. Exactly. <laughs> Some things I guess just got lost in translation. Few more words. Widows, orphans, and runts, which don't sound like typographic terms at all, but in fact are. Uh, they're all different ways in which kind of line breaking or word wrapping can mess up the setting of your text uh, and make it a little bit harder to read. Rivers are the same way when you have like breaks between words that line up over several lines of text and they kind of create these rivers <laughs> through your text block. They can be a distraction, especially if you have a lot of text. This is most noticeable if you're setting like a blog article or an ebook or something. This can become quite distracting. Several different types of dashes. You might have thought all dashes were the same, but again, one more thing that you can correct other people around and be quite pretentious about. So there are in fact three different types of dashes, hyphens, n dashes, and m dashes that all have different grammatical purposes. And in fact, the n and m dash terms come the, uh, from the width. So an n dash will always be the same width as the n character in your typeface, and the m dash will always be the same width as the m character. The other thing that I wanted to talk about with type are some types of type, right? So we've talked already a little bit about our desperate desire to categorize things, and it's the same thing with type. We've tried to group things based on style or usage or history, similarities or differences. There are so many categories and subcategories of typefaces, but I kind of wanted to go through four of the most common here so that when you're talking about type or describing kind of what you're looking for, uh, these might be things that could help you do so. So serifs refer technically to these small decorative lines that are found on the characters themselves, but are also a way to describe typefaces that have these on the characters. Uh, they will feel a little bit more professional and old school they're associated with like tradition or legacy or age. They're also really good if you're setting large blocks of text because the characters themselves look, the serifs distinguish the characters more. So it makes it easier for us to skim. Or better also for people with like dyslexia because it becomes easier to tell each individual character apart. Sans serifs, you've definitely seen working in tech. Thanks to their clean and modern look, they've become pretty ubiquitous, right? Uh, they're good for communicating youth, trendiness, modernity, or technology. Display typefaces uh, are a little bit funkier, a little bit weird. They have lots of personality. They're very distinctive. Um, but because of that, they can also be a little bit less readable, and they have to be set in a pretty large font size. And finally, script typefaces, which are also a little bit self-explanatory. They mimic that kind of handwritten script. Some will be more stylized than others, um, but they'll always kind of add a little bit of humanity to your design. They're good for when you want to convey a feeling of like thoughtfulness or something being artisan or very handmade. Uh, script fonts can be really great for that purpose. As you're kind of thinking through what to choose, there are some kind of guiding questions here that might help you kind of narrow it down and figure out what suits each thing best. <laughs> but I think I have and managed it <laughs> in an hour. We blitzed through it. Um, but I really hope that this was kind this of is, enough to get yeah, a feel. This is for so it. much stuff. This is so it much so knowledge. Much. <laughs> it is just like an info dump of my whole mm -hmm. first year of college. <laughs> oh wow, it was just first year. <laughs> yeah, I did take design foundations and wow. like all of okay. that is kind of kind of the building blocks that you put everything else on top of, I would say. <laughs> so. yeah, really dumb question coming from, you know, a lay person here. So no such thing. <laughs> folks who are who don't know the signs and are creatively challenged like myself are you telling us that you know design minded people or designers keep all of this in mind or is this where like design systems come in where you are already kind of falling into a pit of success all of this is kind of taking care of you uh, or is that not yes an assumption yes and yes um okay. 
I would say, yeah, uh, you do kind of, once you get to that point, the more you kind of practice, the more of this you don't have to think about in the same way. You just kind of know, you know, it's like when you first start coding, you're thinking about everything. Or maybe a better example, when you first start driving, right? You're like incredibly aware of Mm -hmm. every knob and every button and what everyone else on the road is doing. And I remember learning to drive at 16 and thinking like, oh my God, how could people even possibly text and drive? I can barely drive and drive. (laughs) Like... But once you've done it for a while, you're like fiddling with the radio, you're dictating things to Siri, like, yeah, you could get somewhere and realize your mind has been elsewhere the whole time. Design's the same way. Once you've learned, I think anything, once you get good at it, you can kind of put it on autopilot a little. Design systems, I think, are more for once you have standardized, once you have made design choices, communicating them quickly and easily throughout a whole team. Right. Yeah. Someone telling me not to drive like that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that don't we all know, but you still sometimes end up doing stuff. I don't text and drive. I swear to God, no, I don't I, text I, and I drive. Don't yeah. I do think about other things while I'm driving. <laughs> but you know, your, your muscle memory comes in. This is where, yes. yeah. But no, I think design systems are more for communicating design choices, right, amongst a whole group of people so that when you bring a new designer on, you don't have to sit them down and teach them every single design choice that has been made for the application up until this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, for us to kind of get a start, like this is where, uh, you know, design systems are there for us to, you know, developers to mind of maybe get a start on, you know, just starting with the foundation where you kind of know how things are going to flow down this is where the accessibility guidelines come into play so you kind of know what to do and what not to do and all of your ui kind of trickles down from there but uh you know as as developers we hope that somebody has thought this through because like this is difficult for (laughs) us to you know always keep in the back of our mind you know layouts fonts and you know colors this is we're going to mess this up so we need help uh, if possible yeah, I mean, design systems are kind of like guardrails, maybe, or like anytime you see a brand guide, right? It's like you could make any of these design choices, and we've narrowed it down. <laughs> right. You know, please work within these parameters so that everything we do looks at least vaguely similar. You know, so that when you go to the website, it looks kind of the same as the stuff we're posting on Twitter, and that website looks kind of the same as the app, so that that feels cohesive, and that kind of gives a that makes users more trustworthy right because we've kind of learned what looks like we have learned that things that are inconsistent look like scams (laughs) you know if you click on something in the email and it takes you to a website that looks totally different you get kind of nervous (laughs) so that kind of continuity in this age of like digital security has become really really important (laughs) yeah and you know coming from the world of like cross-platform you know dev Again, that consistency uh, can be used, you know, against you, or it can be, you know, used, you know, to have the user have a similar experience. But I mean, so much of the abstraction kind of, um, you know, takes away the platform-specific things that are different. Uh, it's like you, you're not always making, you know, the next Facebook. You're sometimes you're trying to, uh, you know, cater to those platform experiences. So it's it's a fine balancing act. Yeah. All right. Well, this is this is great stuff. I'm going to repeat what Nabam said. This is a lot, but can people find <laughs> this anywhere? Yes, I need to grab the link. I've posted it on Twitter once or twice. I will post it again. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen so that I can look it up. I've got it also in a Google Slides thing, and I will share that link with you momentarily as soon as I can get to it. Yeah, I can have it here. <laughs> um, there's also effectively a transcript that I can share with y'all because I write every Ooh, talk nice. out word for word because I'm a crazy person. Wow, wow. So, <laughs> uh, so that, I'm putting these in the chat. That's the link to the deck. And let me make sure I've got the sharing permissions correct on the transcript. There we go. Let me know if for any reason you have difficulty opening that, but that should talk you through it down to the slide changes because I've never been relaxed a day in my life. 
<laughs> so. Yeah, this is this is very very good stuff. Uh, Eye opening. Uh, so much of science behind uh, what we do and what yeah. we expect, you know, from design minded people. This is where you come in. Yeah. yeah, I think that's like my hope always when I give this is that somebody goes away thinking like, ah, it's not just like designer magic, yeah. you know? Because I feel like that's often the idea is like we'll hand this to the designers and they'll make it look pretty or they'll work their magic and then give it back. And I'm like, wow, oh, no, this is totally just a process. You could do this too. Like, you know, it's, it's a skill that needs to be learned, but it's not, it's not out of reach of anyone who's interested in picking it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, yeah. There's my, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is really good stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, happen to agree. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, these principles, like if we just keep them in the back of our mind, like even as uh, when, even as developers, when we have the freedom to, you know, do layouts, like that's what we are always doing, right? At least mm -hmm. these fundamentals kind of help us guide down the, you know, right principle or, you know, right you know, foundations. Yeah. yeah. Same. You're Very all making stuff. design decisions all day long. Sometimes that's in your applications and sometimes that's in like picking a shirt and a tie that coordinate colors, right? <laughs> the more you can kind of pick it up, I think you see that yeah. all over. That helps your whole life. That's <laughs> that's my cell. Get better at everything. Get, be a designer. <laughs> yeah, really good stuff. And uh, yeah, Code with Sean, Napam, everybody else in the yeah. chat room. Thank you for hanging out with us and, yeah. and asking Thanks for having questions. Me on. Yeah, yeah. Was fun. This was great. And uh, yeah, uh, user group uh, folks, uh, thanks for hanging out. And the, uh, the regulars who come in and you know, join us. Uh, this was great. And Catherine, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your evening, coming out and doing this with us. And yeah. For sure. Yeah, for uh, we'll do all of the other coded live uh, shows like we normally do, but just for this user group meeting, we'll be back on uh, next month again, third Monday. So come and join us as your time permits. So that's it uh, from us, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, uh, hope you are you know well, being productive, and uh, we'll see you around on the next stream. All right, yeah, <laughs> bye bye, folks. <laughs>